In territorial America, a party, or frolic, as it was called, was a major event. In 1820, Governor Miller wrote from Arkansas Post that parties and balls were all-night affairs on Saturday and Sunday. People came from scattered settlements and farms and from hunter camps, bringing with them songs, dances, games, and stories. I had with me as two as good a dogs that ever fought a bear, Sharp Tooth and General Jackson. And if there is any difference betwixt the two, them was the best. Well, did you see any bear? If you call a big black thing as big as your horse a bear, I saw one. I was the first one to fire, but I only wounded him. And them dogs is off with a crack of the gun. And they run right up to him, and he smacked two of them little ones right in the middle of next week before you could say Jack Robinson. He was a tremendous bear. Well, you must have had some meat. 2,700 pounds of clean meat. Nary a bone in it. Stacked safe in the smokehouse. That was meat. And that was after we had the biggest frolic north of the Arkansas River that year. Why, ladies come all the way up from Little Rock just to see my bear and to dance with the man that killed it. Ladies? <laughs> well, I believe Ben's scared of the ladies than he would be of that bear. Oh, oh there ain't nothing to be scared of if you know how to treat him. You just gotta be polite, like, with your mama. With all this rain, they'll probably be having a frolic soon. They'll have a good fiddler there. There'll be some dancing. You've danced a cotillion, ain't you? Well, no. I done some reels. Oh, well, there's nothing to it. First thing you gotta do is get a lady to dance with you. So you walk up to her and you say, May I have the pleasure of this dance? Then you take your hand, then you kind of bow to her, then you square up, and then you dance. Back. Back this way now. Maybe you'll get straggy. Don't you dance? I reckon I do. If it's a real, I get to swing them pretty gals up and down the line. I'd like to show them folks a few devil's fork steps. <laughs> well, let me get you a partner then. I'm much obliged to you, sir. Merci. Uh, you remember my friend, Mr. Hooten of the Devil's Fork? I hope you're well, miss. Mr. Hooten? How'd you leave your sister Sam? Oh, mighty well, miss. Thank you. Will you allow me the pleasure to dance with you? Um, no need to get mad, Ben. If you want to dance with Gab, just bow to her and ask for the pleasure of dancing with her. Well, try that on that pretty little critter right there. Hey, you folks, how about dance with the Virginia Reel? You men over here and the ladies over there. You have a dude over there, Ben? Turn back. Turn by the right. Back by the left. Over the years, whether in fancy balls or in backwood frolics, in schools or even church camp meetings, the Virginia Reel has been the favorite dance of Arkansas. It evolved from European dances like Sir Roger de Coverley, which, according to legend, was George Washington's favorite dance. What people liked was its simplicity and vigor. Lines go forward and back. Dancers a la man by the right and left hands. They turn using both hands and do -si do Now the head couple gets to show off a little. They sashay down the set and back. And then 
comes the actual reel, sometimes called strip the willow. As you fly down the set, you can put in some devil's fork steps if you wish, and you can swing as hard as decorum permits. Just like a handmade quilt, no dance or song, no gathering was ever exactly like any other. But the patterns of each survive to give color and warmth for generations to come. Why, sure, here's one I just learned last week. Oh, who hasn't seen Kitty Clyde? She lives in the world of a hill. Little sly, little nut, my clear winding brook that powers her father's old mill. More than a century and a half ago, early settlers in Arkansas brought with them a love for traditional arts, making music, singing, creating crafts, and dancing. Indeed, for many years, the fiddle and the old-time square dance were mainstay entertainment at frolics or hoedowns. Square dancing had its social appeal, smiles, hand-holding, or a good quick swing. But it was also a good time for individuals to express themselves in jig dancing. When an active couple promenaded down the set, they, especially the men, liked to show off using special jig or buck steps. But even when couples were just circling or watching, they used a basic but individualized two-step jig. Jig dancing is not unique to Arkansas. It has European antecedents dating back at least to Shakespeare's time. But it has become a symbol of traditional values for the state. Most jig dancers use an erect body posture, arms dangling at their sides with lively but modest footwork. Others use fluid and intricate steps and might even flap their elbows as in a pigeon wing. One remarkable jig dancer is 79-year-old Olin Fenley of Leslie, Arkansas. Oh, I've been dancing about 75 years, trying it. My dad learned me what I know. Never take no lesson, just what I learned at home, and just going to square dancing out in the country. And uh, teach these girls to dance, you know. I was just pretty good at that, and uh, they enjoyed it. There's an old man over where he played the fiddle, you know. And he'd say, well, we better take the bed down. I think these people want to dance. They'd take down the bed, you know, clean out the room. Yeah, that just suited us. Of course, when you dance, you have to pay the fiddler. Yeah, I'd give him a dime. And then they got to the, had to give him a quarter, you know. But the dime was hard to get. As in clogging, tap dancing, and other step dancing forms, a wide variety of steps have evolved from the basic jig step. Toe and heel brushes and taps, leg swings, hops, double shuffles, and syncopations. Unlike other step dancing forms, jig dancers generally do not wear taps on their shoes, wear special costumes, dance in lines, or learn to dance in schools. Local champion Hubert Engel learned jig dancing much like Olin Finley did. So I really wasn't taught. I just more or less taught myself. I started dancing whenever I was about four. Most of my steps I've learned was just watching the people that dance around the Mountain View. Hubert finds a considerable difference between clogging and jigging. Cloggers have a different routines, which the jiggers, there are no routines. Certain jiggers may have certain steps they always do. I know I do. 
but you're in certain positions where you can just do anything you want. I love to hear the audience roar. I'm conceited, I think about showing off. <laughs> Whereas jig dancing is a folk step dancing art form, for many years there were very active step dancing forms on stage in the minstrel shows. Along with the body songs, jokes, storytelling, contortionists, startling mechanical effects, caricatures and the like, there were European jigs, hornpipes and English clogging, as well as African folk dances, particularly walk-arounds and ring shouts. Clogging is currently popular as a show form of step dancing. Modern clogging groups like the Ozark Foothill Cloggers use precision line dances which don't require partners or a specific number or gender of dancers. Unlike jig dancers, precision cloggers wear identical costumes and try to do identical steps. Since most routines are choreographed to specific records, Live music is often not desirable. The speed, vitality, and variety of these dances make them especially attractive to teens and preteens. An intermediate form developed out of Appalachian, Mountain Square, and Big Circle dancing after 1940. It's called Old Time Clogging, demonstrated here by the Arkansas Country Dancers. These dances still retain square dance figures as the focus of the dance, along with partner swings, left alamans, circles, and individual expression. But choreographed footwork, similar costuming, and precision actions are at least as important. Even today, one of the highlights of any traditional musical gathering comes when somebody gets up and breaks into a step dance. Lead her up, send by the world, lady, go one way, gent, go the other, and when you meet, everybody swing, everybody pull, and dance around that corner girl. The American Square Dance. As a dance form, it's merely a circle dance for four couples. As a part of American cultural history, it has as sure a place as quilting bees and homemade bread. The Square Dance evolved into distinct regional styles in the 19th century from proper and somewhat intricate French cotillions and quadrilles. Many writers depicted the southern highland forms found in Arkansas as crude, boisterous affairs with banjos, wild dancing and drinking, and an occasional brawl. Ozark folklorist Vance Randolph claimed that quarrels between rival clans often come to a head at dances. Sometimes the roof of the building is riddled with bullets, the lamps thrown down and broken, and other serious damage to the host property is done before the entertainment is over. But the dances and notions of proper behavior varied from community to community. Old time Stone County caller Kermit Taylor, like most folks, remembers square dances as family affairs. So we'd go to, a, to somebody's house that just gave a dance, and all the neighbors would come in and dance. We'd have a good time, and he'd walk to, the, to wherever we was going to, to fiddle, and 
and my mother would carry my baby brother, and and my daddy would carry me and his fiddle. And we'd usually have, he'd usually have somebody to play this banjo or guitar to back him up. And that's where I learned to dance. They'd move the furniture out of one room and we'd dance in it. They'd put the small children all in there and they'd make pallets, what we call pallet, to lay down a quilt. And those babies would be scattered all over them quilts. And sometimes they'd get their babies mixed up and take the wrong baby home with them. As this namesake dance, the Arkansas Traveler, illustrates, old-time square dancing is straightforward without the myriad of figures that became the trademark of modern square dancing after World War II. Dancers go forward and back. They execute a series of right and left elements. They swing their corner. They promenade a new partner home and start over again. One dance might last 15 minutes. Interest is sustained by the simple structure, the energetic music, callers patter, the sound of feet on a rough plank floor, and the chance to cut a pigeon wing. Many dances consisted only of an introductory warmer upper, an ending, and a traveling figure danced by each couple several times. Just as Arkansans liked square dances because they fit into the front room at home or in a local town hall, they chose figures like Birdie in the Cage, Duck for the Oyster, Dive for the Clam, and the grapevine twist, because they pantomimed events in their daily life. Old time square dancing represented strong cultural values. As these values have changed over the last 40 years, old time square dancing has almost disappeared. Kermit Taylor, who still calls dances regularly at the Ozark Folk Center, is cautiously optimistic. Yes, yes, it's here to stay, I think. I hope so. And we need to learn more young people the old, traditional Ozark Mountain Square dances. Many songs, dances, and customs from the culture of frontier America are much more than artifacts today because contemporary people have found them still enjoyable and full of meaning. But the pace and attitudes required for survival in contemporary culture has made at least one activity from that era, the play party, something of a relic. Play party games exist now only as conscious recreations or as fragments that show up occasionally on school playgrounds.
Schools taught play party games like Zudio, London Bridge, and Paw Paw Patch because they develop cooperation and coordination. And kids liked them because they involved fun things. In children's versions of play party games, you run, jump, shove, and fall down. But Farrell Simpson remembers that there was a different atmosphere 50 years ago. Well, I grew up in the country, really, and uh, we didn't have a car. Our folks didn't have a car. Most people didn't have a car at that time. And, uh, of course, there's no television. Uh, not very many people had radios. And uh, you didn't go to the movies. You couldn't do that. So about the only chance we had to uh, have any kind of uh, social activity was to go to a play party. And uh, uh, from time to time, some, some neighbor would uh, let his house be used to give the party. And all the kids in the neighborhood would be invited. And, uh, and so we had a party. I didn't know at the time really what the purpose of all this was, but as I look back at it, I guess it was to uh, get boys and girls together. <laughs> you might go around the house with some girl. It's dark when you go around the house, and uh, there would be certain opportunities if you were brave enough to take advantage of them, like you might hold the girl's hand or something. But I was so shy at that point that I don't think I got closer than six feet to the girl, uh, even though I was required to go around the house with her. Play party dances could take almost any form, from simple circles or lines to melodramatic plays. But according to prominent Ozark folklorist Dr. Bill McNeil, for all practical purposes, a play party game is a square dance without instrumental accompaniment. The accompaniment is provided by the uh, people in the dance itself. Uh, there are various reasons why these are called play parties throughout uh, the United States at one time, uh, there was a, a lot of communities a religious reason why people didn't want their children dancing or going to dances. And so if you called it a play party, it wasn't a dance and you could go. But sometimes it was uh, just because uh, there wasn't a uh, good fiddler or banjo player in a community to provide the music for the dance. So they... Play party games are easy to learn but most likely will not be revived as a form of popular culture. Resistance to social use of instrumental music is all but gone, and few contemporary young people have the need or patience for drawn out rituals when they want to get acquainted with somebody. I think that play party games were interesting uh, to a lot of people and probably still would be, but uh, they began to decline in popularity primarily because there was so much competition from other types of uh, entertainment. Uh, play party games, many people started looking on them as old fashioned and a lot of people uh, became somewhat ashamed of their heritage, so to speak. The musicians are already tuned up and playing in the historic hangar house in Little Rock as guests start arriving for an evening of dance and entertainment. When this house was built in the 1880s, the hangars, like other city dwellers of means and of Victorian taste, included a parlor where the carpet could be rolled up for dancing.
The first dance of the evening was frequently just a game with a couple dance ending. Like rural play party games, these Germans, or cotillions as they were called, were basically frivolous but effective ways of social mixing. In the 19th century, urban Americans preferred dances of European origin, like the lively polka or the schottisch. The two basic steps of the schottisch are hop steps, but they are not difficult. In this version, couples attentively dance a series of figures arm in arm, and then progress around the circle to a new partner. This assures a high level of interest in continuing the dance. In the basic polka, couples dance a two-step in closed dance position and whirl around the room until exhausted. To avoid fatigue and dizziness, dancers often alternated the basic turning step with specific figures like the heel-toe polka, a predecessor of the now popular Cotton Eye Joe routine. Critics of the polka were offended by the frontal position of the dancers and their excited, heavy breathing. Proclaiming the polka to be especially threatening to a woman's physical and moral health, one reverend claimed to have witnessed several deaths by dancing. If the parlor was large enough to allow it, Arkansans also enjoyed line dances from England. These reels, or contras, as they were called, retained the grace and propriety of the English temperament, but could still be robust. Although danced in different configurations, contras and square dances share many of the same figures, such as the right and left through. Because these group actions offered relatively less opportunity for close contact between partners than the couple dances, protective parents and critics of dance found them to be more acceptable. Perhaps the most popular dance of a successful program was the three-quarter time waltz. This dance of German origin arrived in the United States in the early 19th century and swept the country. Literally, waltz means to turn, and this is the essence of the dance. The man places his right hand around the lady's waist, and she in turn places her arm on his shoulder. With her long dress swishing, they float across the floor, gazing into each other's eyes. If the polka was a threat to decency because it was fast and somewhat intimate, the waltz was worse. But dancers have always loved the romance and grace of it. An elegant waltz was the perfect way to end a lovely and romantic evening. For nearly a century, from the 1830s until about 1920, riverboats were central to the life and culture of East Arkansas. Some 90 years ago, Fanny King was growing up on the largest plantation 
yes. on the Mississippi River. Tell me that. Cotton was king. My father was called a king cotton planter because he had more land in cultivation than anybody in the country. One of our favorite uh, trips, because Memphis was 100 miles from the plantation, and we could get on the Kate in the afternoon about 2 o'clock, and it was really a beautiful ship. And you got on, of course, you walked down this gangplank. You went up some stairs. Then you went into the boat to inside. And I remember the first thing you saw was the bar, which was very popular in those days. Men only. There was a, a, a band, orchestra, on board, and as we pulled into a landing, they always played, and as we were pulling out, they played. So it was, it was really a very nice life. Good morning. May I say how happy we are that you folks from the Jackson Port area have come down here at the landing this morning to welcome us here. As you know, I, B. Jefferson Hankins, captain of this fine boat, bring you some of the best dry goods from the Memphis and St. Louis and uh, the Mississippi area to this region. In addition to that, we bring you some of the cheapest freight on the White River. And as a bonus, we bring you some of the finest entertainment. Let me introduce at this time two of the finest banjo pickers in all of Arkansas, Mr. Curly Miller and Miss Carol Ann. The first steamboat to come up the White River to Jackson Port in 1833 was piloted by Thomas Tunstall, the great-great-grandfather of Lady Elizabeth Luker. Well, the channel of White River up to this point was deep and clear, and he realized the future importance of this, so he began to buy land up and down White River. And eventually, he established a steamboat and built a tavern, and that became the nucleus of Jacksonport in about 1839. The town soon became the hub of trade in North Central Arkansas. The river was the highway. People went on steamboats for wedding trips, business trips, and excursions. They were palatially uh, furnished, and they could carry well over 100 passengers. Sometimes on a single run, those boats could carry out as many as 2,000 bales of cotton. The big boats had their own bands. And often the steamboat captain would invite the citizens of the town to have a dance on board. And the people in the town reciprocated with dances and entertainments in their homes and the big, the courtroom inside the courthouse. Yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for your dancing pleasure, and for the cultural refinement of the young people of the area, may I present dancing master Green and his able assistant, Jenny Marie and Miss Lorraine. They are from Ireland, folks.
Whether the dancing master was really from Ireland or just back east, it was a tough sell in the backwoods of Arkansas. You call that dancing? We've got an old man here that can dance fancier than that. It's a little crowded here on the deck, folks. Let's all go up to the courthouse and have a dance. <laughs> These local, made-up dances were simple and fun. But of course, the dancing master wanted to show off something fancy. If he was lucky, he might be able to support himself by giving lessons for a couple of months here in Jacksonport. We need to work. Mr. Dance Master, why don't you show us a dance from Ireland? Well, that I can do, sir. I'll show you a dance from the County Kerry. I learned it from my mother. If I could have four couples on the the grass here for a little square set dance. I'll show you the dance the way we do it. My assistant here is Miss Jenny Marie, and we'll just do this dance. If we could have a polka tune like that one that I heard. Oh. Here we go. In. with their left hands and swing that partner. Let's have one last chorus here now. In those days, everybody in the town loved the boats. And sometimes there were five or six big boats tied up at a time there. And the town just depended on that for their livelihood, for taking their crops out and for bringing in the orders from the stores and they really loved the boats. I mean, that was, Jacksonport was a steamboat town.
In 1991, Governor Bill Clinton signed a bill making square dancing the state dance of Arkansas. But this commemoration was just the culmination of an evolutionary process that started about 50 years ago. In this caller's book, published by M.M. Cole in 1940, Luther Osenbrink, better known on the WLS barn dance as the Arkansas Woodchopper, wrote, The old-time square dance is soon going to a place in the sun as the nation's most popular form of dancing. The square dance is sweeping the country, and soon everyone will be learning to do the quadrilles and following in the steps their forefathers danced years ago. But the simple, rustic style of Archie's time did not fit the urban American society that emerged after World War II. Following the lead of California, Texas, Oklahoma, and other western states, the first square dance clubs in Arkansas were in cities. For these club dancers, bonnets and overalls disappeared. Modern women dancers wear short dresses and frilly petticoats instead of long dresses. Men wear fancy belts, shirts, and boots, or even sometimes prefer comfortable sneakers. By the mid-1950s, live hoedown music had been replaced by cued records and amplifiers. The caller is a paid professional with a large repertoire of calls, some stage personality, and a good singing voice. The modern square, Western square dancing, as this is known, uh, was developed so that you could dance it all over the world. And we have about 125 moves. Uh, in 22 weeks, we get them to about 90 moves. And basically, they can go anywhere in the state or in the country and do what we call mainstream dancing. Mix-ups happen. But the challenge of learning the calls and interacting with others is what modern square dancing is all about. Actually, it's pretty, pretty simple because uh, the teachers does take you through it step by step. It gets easier. It's, it's a lot of fun. All you're going to do is just really pay attention. But square dancing has no competition. There is no competition in square dancing. Mm -mm. It is all have fun. Big yellow rock. Hey. Very good. Now back to your partner. If you want to feel wanted or loved, just go find a square dance club. You'll get yellow rocks and, and hugs. Bill Wilder started calling 29 years ago. Well, I don't know whether I wanted to be a caller or not, but I, I, I used to like to sing, and so that's what a caller does, and so it just came real easy for me. We have two different calls that we use. One is patter calling, and that's where it's just a hold down or a beat to a music, and you call uh, whatever patterns you want to use. And singing calls is like singing a song, except you use patterns that work out, that's timed to the music, where they'll work out and you get everybody back home. Singing calls usually are, they're, they're records that you buy that has a, one side has a caller that's already calling, and on the other side is just the music. And um, they have a, what I call a cheat sheet, a sheet that goes with it, and you can use his calls if you want to. And your patter calling is a, that's, you've got to know where they are if you, I, I sight call most of the time and what they mean by sight calling is remember where everybody's corner and your partner are and try to get everybody back home. Whatever the changes that have occurred in modern western square dancing, traditional values still abound. At a square dance, of course, there's, there's no alcohol consumption before or during. Now, afterward, on your own time, that's, that's your business. But square dancing is family-oriented. 
When you're elected to an office, it is a joint venture with both of the couple. They, they do it. It's, it's a joint thing. It's it much easier that way because if you didn't, then you would have one sitting out here with doing nothing while the other one was busy. The women really like to put on pretty dresses. They like to design their dresses. They like to be distinctive in their dresses. But then on the other hand, when you come to having a club dress, you can get into some pretty good arguments about which dress is important because we have to think about the different body styles of the women. The kind of dress and the attractiveness is very important to the women as well as to the men. They like their women to look pretty. We have saved this couple for last because they have asked me to announce to the timber twirlers and all their square dance friends that they plan to be married December the 22nd. Like other forms of social or artistic expression, the black dancing experience in Arkansas has been diverse. One component of this diversity has been show dancing. Born in Prescott in 1888, Slow Kid Thompson went from dancing in Dr. Fuller's Louisiana Medicine Show to starring in New York with Florence Mills in U.B. Blake's 1922 hit, Shuffle Along. For years, Arkansas danced to the radio while Sonny Boy Williamson played the blues and sold flour on King Biscuit Time. There was always social dancing on the college campus, such as at AM&N, or back at home in small towns like Wilson, a company town. Black dancers even formed up a square dance for the Centennial Folk Festival in 1936. Senior citizens in Mariana remember dancing in the 40s. We used to dance Susie Q and all of that, two step, and all, all, all of that tap dancing. They, you know, heels hit together. You go pop to pop to pop just like, just like, like a horse. I used to go to Forest City. B.B. Kane came to Forest City, and um, it was a club there, you know, just a big building. When the Joe Lewis trucking was out, I learned to do that. When he first started to fight, you know, he had a little kind of shuffle, and they called the name that the Joe Lewis truck. I was a swing dance, jitterbug and swing dance. I didn't like slow dancing. C. Michael Tidwell, dance specialist at Horace Mann Junior High School in Little Rock, says that dance holds a special meaning for African Americans. I always talk about how when the Africans were brought to America as slaves, that they lost a lot of their cultural things. The first thing that was taken from them was their language, then their type of dress, then it was their drums and their music. So they lost a lot of their cultural things, but it began to evolve in a different way. So it came through the church. If you even when you go to church today, you can still hear the rhythms of Africa in the songs that they sing. Or when you're in churches today, there's always the foot stomping or the hand clapping or and what I try to get them doing this dance is it has a religious thing a religious background to it is to bring that African influence into the dance we don't know 
a, a whole lot about African Americans at this time. We want to find out what they were doing. And I, Curtis Tate, storyteller at the Arkansas Territorial Restoration, uses the slave character Luther to make this point. Long time passed, but pretty soon I noticed whenever I see the piece of paper, some laying out there on the desk or some, I could read it. But I didn't let on, and nobody might have never known. I think it's incredible the, the amount of duplicity that existed uh, among the slaves, and they had to do this as, uh, as a means of survival. I mean, if Master thought that uh, he was uh, not uh, very bright or whatever, he would play it up as not being very bright for his purpose, for his advantage. Dr. Gwendolyn Twilley, chair of theater and dance at UALR, on the roots of dance. Yeah, um, African dance has certain characteristics that, uh, of course, European dance did not have, does not have. One of them is the bent knee. Um, the getting closer to the earth than, than you do in normal posture. And uh, the reason for that is um, the getting close to the earth, getting close to the gods of the earth, getting the strength from the earth. Another thing is um, more than one thing happening in the body, or more than one rhythm in, in the whole body. Use of the whole body rather than just the arms and the legs. Uh, the use of the pelvis, the pelvis being the center of life. Uh, movement emanating from the center of the body outward. Uh, the polyrhythms, um, more, again, more than one thing, more than one rhythm going on in the body. One of the other things that comes from, from dances within a group, whether it's a church or uh, maybe the juke joint, um, it's a communal spirit. It's, it, you get strength from the group. And I think that happens um, with um, even the step shows that, that we sometimes see with uh, black fraternities and, and uh, sororities. It's a character building experience. And so you kind of let people know what you're going through and that, uh, that, it, that, it, that it's, uh, it's not something that's easy and that it's a task. And uh, it's kind of a rite of passage from boy to man. Within my training, we try to appeal to the women in the crowd. I mean, we, that, that's, that's our thing. The, capture the attention of the audience and then just give them what they want. The women scream and they yell and uh, all the attention is focused on the guys on stage. Well, uh, I think that, that dance, um, the display of skills on the dance floor is probably a form of, of sexual uh, attractiveness or an effort is made to attract the opposite sex. If you're a good dancer, then obviously you're going to be noticed. So um, um, that's a way to um, um, communicate, if you will, to um, uh, come in contact with, to even meet the opposite sex. So um, that's certainly a, a part of, of social dancing. Nowadays, the dance is they have a lot of different names for them, but you just do whatever you feel is right, you know. You get in the groove with whatever they do. Social dance. I, I don't think you learn it. I think you become part of it. You can walk into an a African-American family and have a toddler and a certain amount of music will come on and that heavy bass beat will happen and they'll start moving. It's just part of their upbringing. It's part of you. It, I think it comes from your culture growing up. It's just music and the dance is there.